G'day everyone and welcome to day 7 of 14 days in self-isolation in southeastern Melbourne. I know you haven't heard from PsyQ in a long while, but since not much is happening in the world, now seemed like a really great time. So I've been in self-isolation in this prison-sized apartment for more than a week now. And when I was talking to my mum about this, she said, well, no one dies of self-isolation. That's kind of true. No one dies directly, but many people do die or get sick indirectly from isolation. Long-term studies of over 3 million people show that isolation has a real physical toll on the body and on the brain, including, ironically, vulnerability to disease. The health consequences of prolonged isolation are as bad as smoking 15 cigarettes per day and include some obvious problems like obesity, which seems reasonable since I'm sitting around in this tiny apartment for the entire day watching YouTube. But social isolation policies also cause some less obvious problems. Problems we probably should have seen coming when you really stop to think about it. Remember that humans are group animals and during our evolution, being excluded from the group was super likely to result in death. So humans are strongly compelled to live in communities and our brains actually reward us for community behaviors like the touch of another human. So when we're isolated from our community, our survival instincts kick in and they cause us a lot of stress. It triggers things like high blood pressure, high heart rate, an increased risk of clinical depression, and also a dramatic increase in our mortality rate. As neuroscientist Dr. Cohen put it, humans have this dire need to connect. Our brains have learned from brutal evolutionary lessons that social isolation is a death sentence. This problem of isolation isn't new to science. A couple of years ago, the UK actually introduced a minister of loneliness. And don't think that you're safe just because you're young or because you live in the West. The studies show that this increased risk of early death applies no matter your age, your gender, your location, or your culture. So please know that social distancing is completely necessary. You should do it. It will help flatten the curve and make this pandemic less bad than it otherwise would have been. But please know that there's also a social cost of being over-enthusiastic about enforcing our social distancing policies. Here's some things we all can do to help offset the cost of social distancing. When you think of ways of fighting the apocalypse, visiting your smelly Aunt Beatrice probably isn't the most sexy of the actions we can take, but it's probably one of the most effective. Humans hate feeling like they might be dirty or that they might be kicked out of a group. So while social distancing is important, please don't yell at supermarket workers to keep their distance. We'll all be better off if you just wash your hands. Human physiology responds positively to human touch. We might not be shaking hands or touching our family members as much as we normally would have, but if you're trapped with another member of the human group, then touch that person more than you might normally. Luckily, our human brains have evolved to consider animals part of our community. So if you're lucky enough to be a pet owner, you can offset the physiology of isolation by hugging your pet. Being isolated is really scary. And we have tens of thousands of generations of human evolution pushing us to be scared of being isolated. So if you're feeling scared, that's totally rational. I know that being in isolation can really suck, but as weird and counterintuitive as it might feel, it's also the best thing that you can possibly do to protect your community. So hang in there, guys.